Our scripture this morning is found in Mark 1, the first five verses. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. I've gotten a glance at the script here while I was standing up front. You're in for a good one this morning. <laughs> Let's thank God for his word. Abba Father, we've come into your house today to hear from you, to hear your word, to be instructed and um, urged by you, Lord, along the right way. Uh, so we thank you for uh, the Holy Scriptures. Thank you for our time, Lord, now to meditate upon them. May your Holy Spirit uh, seal your word to our hearts. In Christ we pray, amen. Uh, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Where is peace? What is the way to it? How is it to be obtained? Uh, last week we saw John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, how he rejoiced at the birth of his uh, son, and not just for the usual reasons that a new dad uh, is happy over the birth of his son, but because this particular son, uh, his arrival is a moving of the hand of God in human history. The arrival of little John the Baptist is, is an act of God's goodwill, a, a movement of his grace toward his people. You, my son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people. Amen. The knowledge of salvation uh, to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God. Remember the, uh, the verse from last week, Luke 1, 78, 79. The day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Okay, that's how we started this study last week, that uh, if man, if any man, woman, or child uh, is to have true and lasting peace, the way to it will have to be revealed to us from outside. It has, it has to be shown to us, and that requires then an act of the grace of God. God must condescend to, to open the curtain, if you like, to reveal the way. Otherwise, forever and for always, human life is going to just be a guessing game, right? And it, was, it will just be a never-ending, pitiful saga of futility, unless the Lord shows us what is the way to peace. Well, the Lord did show us. He has done his part. He manifested the way to peace and by doing so proved his intent uh, to guide our feet into the way, right? Which obviously shows God does love the world and that God is benevolently inclined toward us. Otherwise, if God hated us, he could simply hide the way of peace from us, right? He could just leave us in our sorrow. But he didn't hide. He communicates, right? He sends a messenger. Behold, I send my messenger. John, of course, uh, by no means is the first messenger from God, although he was the first one uh, for several hundred years. Uh, John arrived in a world that was very much not at peace. Uh, it's nation against nation. The land of Israel is uh, conquered and occupied by a uh, hostile force. There's a, uh, a selfish foreign king on the throne, and a big surprise, corrupt government. 
Uh, there is, besides that, there is an entrenched religious elite who uh, love prestige and power and uh, enrich themselves off of, well, let's be frank, the business of worship. And it wouldn't be surprising to find that many of the people in Israel at that time um, would believe that godliness, such as it is, uh, would consist of pretty much keeping the various regulations about the Sabbath and the holidays and bringing alms and offerings with some sort of regularity into the temple. Okay? In other words, keeping the forms of religion. Okay? The temple system uh, is, is part of their life. Right? It's just an undeniable, it's always there. Right? It's an ever-present part of their culture. This is, this is who we are. Right? And this is, these are our obligations toward God. And if we keep those and do those for long enough, uh, we've performed our part then, haven't we? That's kind of an attempt at peace, right? This is how we maintain our connection to God. These rites and practices are, are how we connect with him. And if we continue in them, God will answer, hopefully, and he will bring about the peace for which we long. Okay? We make motions toward him. Um, we can expect him to make motions toward us. Here's the question, though. Are they the right motions? Is religiousness what the way of peace consists of, right? Can being religious bring us peace? I think that a lot of us have gotten to believe that it's supposed to, okay? But Christians do what we do, and yet for many of us still, uh, peace seems to evade us. There's still no peace. Well, why is that? John has the answer for us, okay? If you want to walk the way of peace, you have to take the first step on that way, which, of course, that first step, God indicates what it is, and that first step is repentance. Okay, to guide our feet into the way of peace, this is what John came to do, what does that mean? It means that the guide is going to set your feet down in a certain place and say, go that way, right? Take this first step from here. That first step is repentance, and you're never ever going to arrive at a lasting peace unless you begin with that. John, verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. What is preparing yourself for the Lord? It's repentance, right? And I'm afraid that this is very much bypassed and overlooked in our day, uh, definitely by people outside the Christian sphere, but I think even by many within it who continue to have trouble arriving at peace. Maybe we need to take a closer look. Okay, maybe you have not been walking the way of peace the way that God designated and revealed it. What do you understand by repentance? Has your search for peace um, begun properly? John is the forerunner of the Messiah, right? John's duty, his calling is to do what? It's to prepare hearts, right? We have a Christmas song, a very famous one that says, let every heart prepare him room. How is that done, right? If I'm going to sing the other Christmas song that says, oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there's room in my heart for thee. How is that room prepared for the Lord? Uh, the question is, did you actually prepare him room, or are you just kind of saying, I want peace, I need peace, so uh, Jesus, please give me peace. Is that how it works? What's John's message in a nutshell? How is he making ready the people? How is he preparing them for the coming of the Messiah, guiding their feet into the way of peace? His message is this, the kingdom of God is near at hand, therefore... Repent. Okay, verse 5. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Confessing their sins. And I want to emphasize a couple of points about repentance. Uh, the first is that we must understand what repentance is. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, the word that was used... Uh, for repentance uh, means more literally to turn back. 
Okay, it means to turn around. Uh, you know the scripture that says, let the wicked forsake his way. Right, you're going the wrong way. Let the wicked forsake his way and let him do what? Return. That's John's message. Therefore, repent. Then certain things happen. Right, then if you return, then the Lord will have mercy on him. Right, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. You have to turn back from that way. Okay, it seems right, it seems good, there are pleasing things and enjoyable times along that way, things that make a man smile, things that make him laugh, uh, things that look promising, things that entertain and soothe and ease the pain and stroke the ego, right, the sense of self. I like this way, this is a good way. It doesn't last. It can't last because it fails to take into account the most basic first fact of our existence, and that is that we owe our existence to a creator God, a righteous God, who has standards of goodness, love, purity, truth, justice, and so on. Okay? And those standards apply to his creatures. Men and, as men and women, we are moral agents. We make uh, decisions with moral content. The things that we do and the things that we uh, think about, uh, the things that we say and the things we consume and watch uh, and appreciate and participate in, okay, whether out in the open or in private, those things are not neutral matters of indifference. Okay? They're not matters of no consequence. There's moral content to them. And very, very often, the things that we do and think and say and the way that we look at the world, when they bump up against God's righteousness and justice and truth and goodness, they're found lacking. Okay? They don't match with God's standards. And that is, of course, what we call sin. Okay? Sin is the gap between us and communion with God. Right? Sin is the mismatch between ourselves and God's perfection. Right, our own uh, fallen conduct and our thought life. Sin, therefore, is the barrier that prevents us from coming to rest in a peaceful, <clears throat> harmonious existence in the bosom of the Lord. Now, although the Lord tells us that that is so, tells us your sin separates you from God, uh, tells us return to me and I'll return to you, tells us let the wicked forsake his way, we prefer to stick to our own way, right? At least partially. It may not be a huge part, but it's, you know, it's still a part, right? Because of the occasional momentary pleasures that we perceive to be along the way that we want to go, right? And our natural self says, I like this way. I've always been this way. This is who I am. I really don't think you ought to ask me to change. I think you ought to accept me just as I am. And to complicate the issue, here is the foolish church for the last 50 or more years telling people that God accepts you just as you are. Rather than saying, God lays hold of you and wills for you to come out from that life and be transformed, be renewed in your mind. No, no, it's, you're all right just as you are, just how you are, don't you worry a moment about it. Now, you tell me, and if you have a pastor who likes to insist that God accepts you just as you are, you get him to tell you, how does that sit in the same room as repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? A large part of the Christian tradition in the West now has ceased to speak in terms of repentance, of humility before God, of righteousness and unrighteousness, of forsaking a wicked way and impure thoughts. Right? God as the law revealing God of perfection has been sort of thrown out, discarded as the tyrant of the Old Testament. He's been replaced by a new and improved soft God and a milquetoast Jesus who really only ever preached about kindness. And somehow the only ones who ever got on this Jesus' nerves are the church people. Right? The, the conclusion we're supposed to come to then is that the real bad guys are the ones who are distressed about sin, 
who are saying that there are lines between right and wrong and that God is the one who laid them down. You just keep on being you. Hey, you go on thinking however you like to think. You act however you want to act. If you don't like a certain part of the Bible, it doesn't square with what you think it should say, well, then just set it aside. Okay? Don't let anybody make you feel bad. Don't ever question yourself. God is just wild about you. Okay? So be at peace. So there's the offer of peace, right? I don't know where they got that Jesus from, but it wasn't from those who were eyewitnesses of his life. Okay? Jesus, you see it before uh, chapter 1 is even halfway over, Jesus comes right on the tails of John the Baptist and says exactly the same words, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's in verse 15. Okay? This is the same Jesus who said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The same Jesus who said, I came to call sinners to repentance. Jesus who said, go and sin no more. Who said, uh, who are my brothers and who is my mother? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's my brother and sister and mother. Jesus who said, woe to this crooked and perverse generation that the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now a greater one than Jonah is here. As long as churches continue to pretend to their people that God the Father and God the Son are unconcerned about uncleanness, disobedience, mistreatment of people, Um, about things that defile your soul and your body, then the people who listen to them are never going to come to peace. Right? We saw it last time in Isaiah. You've made for yourself a crooked path. Whoever follows that way will not know peace. Uh, So I invite you to turn over to Isaiah chapter 30. Again, I've given you a couple scriptures, uh, extra ones uh, in the bulletin today. Isaiah 30, if you're using your pew Bibles on page 816. And I want you to follow along with me, starting in verse 8, if you would, please. All right, Isaiah 30 and verse 8. The Lord says to him, go write this message, all right? Go write it before them on a tablet and note this on a scroll, uh, basically that it may be there for them as a testimony to them, right? That it may be there uh, for time to come and forever and ever. Well, great, we've got our copy right here. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear that is comply with the, word, the law of the Lord, who say to God's messengers, right, who say to the seers, do not see. Okay, I don't want to hear about your visions and your impressions of God and the word of the Lord. They say to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. I don't want to hear about rightness. Speak to us smooth things. Prophes- this is so ironic. Prophesy deceits for us. Right? Lie to me. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path and cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Don't show me God. Here's God's response. Verse 12. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them... Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall, like a bulge in a high wall whose uh, collapse, like a collapsing building or a collapsing dam, comes suddenly in an instant. And he shall break it like the breaking of a potter's vessel. I mean, you have to imagine one of those clay jars. What would happen if you smash it? I mean, it just blows to a million pieces. Okay, like the breaking of a potter's vessel, which is broken in pieces. He shall not spare... And there shall not be found among the fragments, right, even a a little useful thing, right, even a shard big enough to scoop a coal from the hearth or to dip water out of a cistern. In other words, totally uh, blown to smithereens. 15, for thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, this is that word, okay, maybe your version says in repentance, because that's what it means. In repentance and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not. Right? Here's the word of the Lord. Repent, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. People resist repentance. 
And you said, no, we will flee on horses. All right, well, this is the historical situation then, you know, Israel being invaded by one of their neighboring uh, countries, right? The prophets are telling the Israelites, amend your ways and God will send the enemies away, right? Return to me, I will return to you. Right? You, we will flee on horses and say, we don't want to amend our ways. I don't want to hear about right and wrong. We're not going to change, so we'll just make a run for it instead. Okay? Therefore, you shall flee. You say, we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. And a thousand shall flee at the threat of a single one. And at the threat of five, you shall flee until you are uh, left as a pole on top of a mountain or a banner on a hill. Just imagine like a hilltop with a single uh, lonely stick on top of it, you know, how forsaken it looks, okay? Uh, um, The Lord saying, return to me, I'll return to you, I'll send your enemies away, they said no, okay? It's very, very common in the human heart, and I say, even in the heart of those who attend on the word of God, when there is something sinful in the heart, there is something that you take the pains to resist purging out and getting rid of, okay? So 18 says, Guess we're going to have to have it the hard way, right? Therefore, the Lord will wait. We're going to have to let this trouble play itself out. And perhaps then you will reconsider. This is God's grace. The Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore, he will be exalted, uh, exalted against you in the short term, so that in the long term, he may have mercy on you. Uh, For the Lord is a God of justice, or, or God is a God of right judgment. Blessed are those who wait for him. And it's right below this that the Lord says, this is the way, walk in it, right? Don't turn aside to the right or to the left, okay? Repentance means to return and cease resisting the will of the Lord. And this is what the people did. They came to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, confessing their sins. They're coming clean. They are are surrendering. Uh, Isaiah, again, is the other verse I put in the bulletin for you, chapter 48. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, The Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is profitable, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Okay, John came preaching a baptism of repentance and the people came confessing their sins, confessing their sins. We have not heeded your commandments. We have not done what is conducive to our peace. We have not done what is profitable to our souls. Okay, the proverb says, whoever conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will receive mercy. So the people knew they had to prepare the way for the Lord by doing this, confessing their sins. The other thing then for today that we have to recognize is that repentance is not just an initial act, okay? It is a continual way of life for the rest of life, right? It's not just a few words at a baptism. It's not just getting down on your knees and saying a sinner's prayer and saying, whew, I am so glad the uncomfortable part of this is over now, okay? Repenting is an ongoing way of life for the rest of life. Uh, People say, have you repented? And you say, yes, of course I did, right? Uh, uh, Are you a Christian? You know I am, right? Uh, um, There was, by that they mean there was an initial event in my life. There was an initial moment when I said, I knew I have to become a Christian. I've got to get right with God. I had to make a change, okay? But somehow, why is there still this question then? Where is peace? Why don't I have peace? Well, it's possible because repentance has not been a day in and day out quality of your life since then. And the reason is because, well, repentance requires this big dose of humility, and so it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to uh, examine yourself and to, uh, to search yourself for sin and evaluate all of the little things and big that you do and that you think about and that you watch and that you consume and that you say and that you participate in and that you enjoy and the way you treat people and say of each thing is this godly does the holy spirit approve is he satisfied with with this am i setting my mind on things above or is this one of the things beneath 
It is actually one of the things beneath. As a matter of fact, it's from below. Should I not part ways with this? Should I not set it behind me forever? Should I not change something about my life? That's uncomfortable. So you know what happens? We just don't do it. But if we don't do it, you can't walk the way of peace. Okay, what we usually do instead is to figure out a way to justify the thing that, uh, and defend our own actions and our choices. Say, well, I like this, you know. Even though you may say, you know, it's a, it goes against the goodness of God and his purity, and even though it doesn't meet, you know, the Philippians 4.8 criteria, it's not something that's true, lovely, pure, virtuous, just, okay, I still like it. Right? I still get a visceral response from this. Therefore, I'm just going to keep it, you know, and I'm going to keep going on this way. It's not that bad. You know, other people are worse than me. So sin doesn't get cleansed out. You know, there's a bad habit. There is a lust. There is a covetousness. There is spite. There is selfishness. Something. And it gets validated instead of being gotten rid of. That's not repentance, is it? It's not really making room in your heart for the Lord if you still have this other thing occupying this space. Okay, one more thing from uh, Mark. If you didn't lose your place, I lost my place. Um, John, Mark says that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. Now, if in your heart you really had the knowledge of the remission of your sins, you'd be going on your way rejoicing. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Yes, go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Okay, but if there's still a sin, if sin still has a place in your life, there's no wonder you're still restless. Okay, how do you expect the remission of sins without the required repentance? Right? Repentance is essential to the remission of sins. And so no wonder your conscience is cranking and bothering you, telling you there's something out of whack here because you have this black area. You have this, uh, this stain. Well, I feel bad that I'm doing it. That's not the same thing as confess and forsake, is it? If you're reserving yourself a right to a sin and you're not turning back from it, you're living in some kind of no man's land, or at least it feels that way. Hey, am I a Christian? Am I a not? What's going to happen to me because of this? You feel like you're distant from God. There's a separation. There's a gap there. That's because there's an inconsistency. There, you know, there is an area of unrepentance in, in, in life. You're trying to go two ways. Well, those two ways parted, and you can't walk them both. Okay? You, you, you can't have pardon for sin and continue in sin. Okay, the Spirit doesn't let you get away with that. He troubles your conscience and keeps you from having peace until the conditions for peace are met. Okay, and the Holy Spirit says this, that if we continue to sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer a sacrifice for sins, only a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation that will consume God's adversaries. And that's a terrible thing to live with that certain fearful expectation, okay, that unquiet conscience. Okay, so you have two choices, either repent, which is the right choice, or else stifle the conscience, okay? And you find yourself drifting farther and farther away from God and less and less peace. And you say, well, I say my prayers, I read my daily bread, and I ask God for help, I ask him for peace, it's really not that different from those old Israelites, right? We make motions toward God. Why isn't God making motions toward us? Well, are they the right motions? What about repentance, right? What about the things in your life that defile soul and body and mind? Those places of resistance and, and reluctance and self-serving, okay? Uh, the Lord said to Paul, it's a Saul, it's, uh, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. I am the Lord your God. I teach you what is profitable. I lead you by the way you should go. If only you would heed my commandments, your peace would be like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Hey, you want to walk the way of peace? Thanksgiving holiday coming up. You want peace for the Thanksgiving holiday and for the uh, Christmas season that comes after it? Then clean house, my friend. Repent. 
Clean it for good, right? Prepare a clean room for the Lord Jesus Christ and stop trying to go both ways, continuation in sin and uh, remission of sins. Your conscience knows it does not work that way. Every thought in captivity to Christ no unclean thing before my eyes, putting away all malice, envy, jealousy, and deceit and hypocrisy, out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, and into thy freedom and gladness and light. Jesus, I come. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. Come out from among them and be separate. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you, says the Lord confessing their sins, confessing their sins. They made room in their hearts for the Prince of Peace. Let's bow before the Lord. Almighty Father, you know the heart. You know every detail. You know our coming and going. You know our rising up and our lying down. You know the very thoughts which we entertain. You know the things that we look at, the things that we like things of the flesh, things from down here below, and things from the pit of hell, Lord. You know us all. Help us to walk the way of peace, confess, forsake, find forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Praise be to your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to us today. In your holy name we pray. Amen.